So now we have seen that each of these factors contributes x minus lambda i to the power d i to the characteristic polynomial and x minus lambda i to the f i to the monic polynomial. But we do not yet know about the comparison between the numbers d i and f i, these positive integers, which one is greater, which one is lesser and so on, right. But let us look at a i i minus lambda i i and define this as n i. What do you think is the monic polynomial for n i? Remember lambda i is now a given fixed number, the ith eigenvalue exactly. What do you think is the monic polynomial for n i? Let us make it simple. What do you think are possible eigenvalues for n i? What kind of a property does this have? n i. I am now going to claim that this n i is a nil potent matrix. What is a nil potent matrix? A matrix which when raised to higher and higher powers eventually at some level it becomes a zero matrix. So the claim is that n i is a nil potent matrix. It is not that difficult to see you see. Why? Because what is the minimal polynomial for a i i? It is x minus lambda i to the k, uh, k i oh, sorry f i right. So mu a i i is equal to x minus lambda i to the f i. So the eigenvalues of a i i are what? <coughs> Only lambda i. So what are the eigenvalues of n i? So this implies eigenvalues of a i i is equal to lambda i and nothing else, right? We have just seen that because its minimal polynomial is of that form, so that can be its only eigenvalue. So, what are eigenvalues of n i? <coughs> For any eigenvalue lambda i of a i i and some eigenvector, you must have a i i minus lambda i i times v is equal to 0. That means n i v is equal to 0. So the only eigenvalues that this fellow can have are zeros, 0. You agree? If the eigenvalues of n i are 0, then minimal polynomial of n i can be some x raised to some power, some arbitrary power. What power exactly do you think it is? Yeah. Let us not get into that question even. Can this be a power more than d i? What is the size of n i? It is d i cross d i. So consider the set with any vector. So for any vector v in v, i v, n i v, n i squared v until n i to the power d i v. Oh, this is not v, I am sorry. This is actually in uh, f to the d i, right. So how many vectors are here? d i plus 1, d i plus 1 vectors sitting inside a d i dimensional vector space. So they must be 
linearly dependent and that linear dependence is exactly how we cook up minimal polynomials but here we already know a priori that the minimal polynomial can be of some uh, hi let's just say actually it's going to be just fi we will see that hi is equal to fi okay nonetheless therefore one of these fellows in fact the linear independence in this case is lost in a very special manner why because if this is the structure of the minimal polynomial at some stage you will have exactly zero so it doesn't matter what vector v you choose you do not have to go up to powers as high as di at most or rather higher than di as high as di is the maximum it gets so ni raised to some power less than or equal to di must vanish please follow the stream of reasoning again i'll repeat what am i saying first we saw that this fellow has a minimal polynomial like so therefore the eigen values of ai i are nothing but lambda i's if the eigen values of ai i is nothing but lambda i then the eigen value of ni defined like so has to be only zero if all the eigen values of ni are zero then its minimal polynomial must have a form like this some hi right so the minimal polynomial has a form like this we want to find out what this form must be what this number must be so now we see that this number cannot be any greater than di because no matter what vector you take how do we find the minimal polynomial just go back to the construction choose any basis for every element of the basis you keep hitting it until you arrive at a linearly dependent set now here the linear dependence will be very special kind you don't actually need multiple fellows because the minimal polynomial has a specific form here so it means that it will be ni raised to some power acting on that particular fellow is zero so you take the highest power among all the fellows in the basis set so first let it act on v1 then on v2 then on v3 then till vdi and look at the highest power to which ni has to be raised until it loses linear independence which is when it becomes zero exactly that's why it's a nilpotent operator right so now can this number hi be any more than di it cannot right so this means that this hi is less than or equal to di but what is this hi hi is nothing but this fi right why fi is the original monic polynomials factor right original minimal polynomials factor now we have constructed this ni if this hi is any different from fi then we will have a contradiction it means that ni has ni when raised to this power hi vanishes and now nowhere before does it vanish yeah that means x minus lambda i yeah for ai i this would have also vanished at that same hi yeah so i did just use this as an artifice but really what we have is hi must equal fi so essentially what we have is fi is less than or equal to di is this part clear it's very important if not i'll repeat what am i saying that when we transferred the argument from aii to ni i just said for argument sake let's take another variable hi but really this hi cannot be anything other than fi because ni is related to aii after all look at this the moment you raise this fellow to some power you are basically raising ni to that same power because they are equal so if hi were different from fi then you had better replace fi with hi there in instead right do you see that i just chose hi on the on the go like that randomly but I, because i didn't want to prolong the argument at that point but the point is hi must be equal to fi if hi must be equal to fi and hi cannot be bigger than the algebraic multiplicity therefore fi also cannot be bigger than the algebraic multiplicity which means what exactly in the context of this 
whatever power you have raised every factor x minus lambda i in the characteristic polynomial that is the algebraic multiplicity you need not raise it to a power greater than that in the minimal polynomial that means the minimal polynomial definitely divides the characteristic polynomial yeah so let me erase this part now so the minimal polynomial divides the characteristic polynomial which leads us to the celebrated Cayley Hamilton theorem that is the characteristic polynomial definitely belongs to the annihilating ideal of A. So this must be 0. In fact the role of the minimal polynomial is not highlighted much because it takes a lot more work as you see of linear algebra to understand how to even get the minimal polynomial. Characteristic polynomial is rather easy because you know how to find a determinant like an algorithm but it suffices you see. So for example some of the applications people say of <coughs> the characteristic polynomial is in finding or the Cayley Hamilton theorem. So this is, so I have not written out step by step but I have argued why the Cayley Hamilton theorem must be true. This is exactly nothing but right? This is exactly the Cayley Hamilton theorem. The utility of this, one of the utilities is if a matrix is invertible, you can just find the inverse of the matrix without those determinant and all those computations. Why? Because you have, <laughs> okay, let me now erase this. Because we know that the Cayley Hamilton theorem is true, suppose you have a to the n plus alpha 1, a to the n minus 1 plus alpha 2, a to the n minus 2 plus so on till alpha naught, oh sorry, alpha n, right? Yeah, i is equal to 0. If the matrix has an inverse, which is to say that it is not singular, that means it has no 0 eigenvalue. If it has a 0 eigenvalue, it cannot be inverted. So if it has indeed got an inverse, then you will have a inverse a to the n plus alpha 1 a inverse a to the n minus 2 plus dot 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 till alpha n a inverse is equal to 0. And now you have a inverse is equal to 1 by alpha n right times summation alpha i a to the uh, n minus i minus, this is n minus 1, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah? Yeah. n minus i minus 1, right? i going from 1, okay, the last fellow will actually remain plus, so there has to be a minus sign here, plus a to the n minus 1. So the last fellow will be what? 1 through n, right? Yeah? No. What should be the number? Oh, the a inverse will go, right? So n minus 1. Yeah? That should be it. So i is equal to 1 is what? Uh, but we have this constant 1 here, right? So it's a monic polynomial. So it's this one I'd keep, rather keep as free from this. So is this right? Yeah. So this is without doing any determinants or anything, provided the matrix is invertible. If it's not invertible, there's nothing you can do, even with determinants, right? But if it's invertible, then just keep multiplying the matrix and you can get an inverse for the matrix by dint of the Cayley Hamilton theorem. Right? <clears throat> so now you might say, okay, there has been enough work done on this. We have got it down to its smallest possible ingredients. 
So we have achieved quite a lot apparently, right? Because we've started with an n cross n matrix. We looked at these a invariant subspaces constructed through co prime factorizations of the minimal polynomials. Along the way, we saw how to cook up the minimal polynomial as well, right? So once you have these co prime factors, you can actually have, we proved the Cayley Hamilton theorem without using determinants. Yeah. And we've also seen that any matrix can be brought down to this block diagonal structure. Each block diagonal size is di cross di, where di happens to be the algebraic multiplicity of lambda i, where the lambda i's are the distinct eigenvalues of the particular matrix, right? So why are we still not satisfied? What do we want to look for further? You see, what is sitting inside each individual block diagonal? What if each individual block diagonal doesn't look very nice? So we are talking about say a 100 cross 100 matrix in which suppose one eigenvalue is repeated 10 times. Then you still have a 10 cross 10 block diagonal matrix and there's a lot of coupling between these 10 variables and that may not be to our liking. We might still want to disintegrate this down. So hereafter, what we are going to look at is the following. We will zoom in on that matrix. So lest we forget, the original representation we have gotten up to this far. A11, A22, AKK, where AII is of size F di cross di. And there's nothing further we can do to this overall thingy here. So this is what A looks like, yeah? Subject to that choice of basis based on the kernels of those irreducible or co-prime factors of the minimal polynomial. Now we want to take a closer look at each individual AII. And we've already seen certain things. What have we seen? We have seen that the minimal polynomial of AII is going to be of the form x to the power fi, oh sorry, x minus lambda i to the power fi, while the characteristic polynomial of aii is of the form x minus lambda i to the power di. question is, can we do something more about this? We know that ni defined as, so these are some of the observations we've made already, a minus lambda i, or sorry, a i i minus lambda i i, <coughs> and ni to the power f i is 0 and n i to the power, um, let us say k is not equal to 0 for k less than f i. That is to say that the minimal polynomial of n i is x to the power f i. We have seen all this. This is a summary of what we have seen so far. Based on this, we now want to get further down, deep down into the structure of A11 and see if we can get it down to a nice looking form. Yeah. You consider that an endeavor worthy of certain merit, right? Worth our while. Why? Because again, obviously, if the DI is pretty large in itself, then we may not have achieved too much. We still have to solve a large size system, okay? So let us get down to the business of studying these Ni-like objects. So now from here on, we will completely focus our attention on nil potent matrices whose minimal polynomials happen to be of the form x to the x raised to some power is equal to 0. And therefore, of course, the characteristic polynomials also happen to be x raised to some other power probably is equal to 0, yeah? 
So that is our attention because if we study this, we can then fit this back in here like a puzzle. So this is already a basis now for this. Now based on this, can we also choose some smart choice, make some smart choice of basis after this to transform this further? Yeah? And that will lead us to the so-called Jordan canonical form. Okay? So what I will do is in whatever time we have left, I will just first give you a statement of the Jordan canonical form. All right? And maybe we will not have time for the proof, but we will try to understand the implications of Jordan canonical form. And if again, if time permits, we will see some applications of the Jordan canonical form. Okay? Maybe in the next module when we have time or the next lecture when we have time, we will go into a detailed proof because the proof takes quite a, quite a while. Okay? But at least that is the reason for us to avoid the statement of the theorem and some of its interesting implications. So here is the statement of the Jordan canonical form. So now our basic vector space is of size di, but we will really consider that our entire space is now n dimensional and the n dimensional, these are all of size n cross n. I mean, when we are fitting it in here, these are of sh surely of size d1 cross d1. But if this is all that we are interested in, there is no point in carrying this subscript and all of this, right? Which is to say that suppose, okay, let us give a numerical example to motivate this better. Suppose you have this matrix. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, minus 3, minus 3. <clears throat> what do you think is its characteristic polynomial? This could be, by the way, one small little matrix sitting here. But for me now, this is nothing but my entire vector space. So I might better as well consider this to be my three-dimensional vector space. So I shall be using n to denote the vector space. So in fact, you can check that this one is uh, x my x plus 1 whole cubed. You can just check. So therefore, its eigenvalue is minus 1. So its minimal polynomial must look like either x plus 1 or x plus 1 squared or x plus 1 cubed. <coughs> Nothing more surely. Yeah, because we have already proved Cayley-Hamilton theorem and in that proof already we saw that the degree to which every factor gets raised in the minimal polynomial is at most equal to the algebraic multiplicity and no more. You do not need to raise it to any higher degree than that. So we, we can also check this here. So you take A plus I. What does that look like? <coughs> 1, 1, 0, uh, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 3, minus 2. Surely this is not 0. So x plus 1 is ruled out, <coughs> but try a plus i squared, is that 0? Well, the first check itself tells you it is not 0, the 1, 1 entry. This multiplied with this leaves you with a 1. So this is also not equal to the 0 operator. And now of course there is no magic in it. You can just go ahead and check that a plus i cubed must be 0. That is essentially nothing but the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Yeah. So just check this as an exercise. So my point behind trying out this exercise is to now tell you that forget about this di, fi and all this i dependence and all this business. Look at our basic operators to only belong to that one kind, which is operators of repeated eigenvalues, operators with repeated eigenvalues. Because if they are not repeated, we exactly know what to do with them. We are now zooming in on each individual block. So, with this motivation, we will not forget about all these index terms and the subscripts and superscripts and we will only consider operators A uh, such that it maps from V to V, chi of A is equal to x minus lambda to the, uh, to the n where the dimension of v is n and mu of a is x minus lambda to what power exactly? Let us give it just some name shall we? 
let us call it f, where of course f is less than or equal to n. So, we are only going to look at this kind of operators now, okay. So, with this in mind, define n is equal to what do you think n is? A minus lambda i, yeah. So, surely this is nil potent, right. In fact, when you raise it to the power f, it becomes just a 0 operator, right. And all its eigenvalues must be 0, right. Just as A has all its eigenvalues at lambda, N has all its eigenvalues at 0. So, then here is the, with this setting, here is the statement of Jordan canonical form. There exist V1, V2 until Vk belonging to V such that <coughs> n raised to the power m v 1 v 1 n raised to the power m v 1 minus 1 v 1 n v 1 v 1 that ends the story with v 1. Next starts the story with v 2 m v 2 v 2 n raised to the power m v 2 minus 1 v 2 n v 2 v 2 dot 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 until n raised to the power m v k v k okay n raised to the power m v k minus 1 v k n v k v k is a basis for v with n raised to the power m v i plus 1 is equal to, okay, I have just chosen v i. So, this i can be any number from 1 through k. What do you think this is? Just a guess. Yeah. So, should it be just this or should I, you know, take this acting on the corresponding vi is equal to 0 which tells me what exactly that is look at these last fellows or the first fellows in these what do you think they are a basis for if I hit these fellows according to this premise if I hit these fellows with another n, they get taken to 0. So, these fellows that I st am starting each of these blocks from, they form a basis for the kernel, is not it? Kernel of n, yeah, that is n to the power m v1 v1 until n to the power m v k v k is a basis for kernel n, okay. It is almost like magical. What does it say? It says that you will be able to find a certain number of vectors inside this vector space 
such that if you keep hitting them with n repeatedly until a point arises where it devolves to 0 and then stack them up like this, you will end up with exactly n number of vectors. Of course, how to choose those v1 through vk in a special manner may not be very obvious at this point, but it says that there does exist and the proof of this, so this is actually the statement of the existence of Jordan canonical form for any operator with repeated eigenvalues. Okay, all its eigenvalues are repeated. So if it is not diagonalizable, at least you can get it down to the Jordan form. Okay, and if you can get it down to the Jordan form, then a basis that takes you to this Jordan form looks exactly like this. Okay, so this N by the way need not look like any special nilpotent matrix, just that matrix I had chosen, right? A plus I, that was a nilpotent matrix for that A 0 1 0 0 0 1 minus 1, minus 3, minus 3, that matrix that I chose and then I took A plus I, right? So that is a nilpotent matrix, this N could be just that nilpotent matrix. So the only question that remains is, of course the proof remains a big question, we will not have time to address that in this module, but the more important question is, suppose you believe this is true, how to choose these V's? It turns out that this choice of V is critical to our ability to get this down. Okay, so we will see that in the next module.